Here comes an intro, and then let's talk about that. All right. Uh, welcome, Pez fans, to what may become the first of many, the inaugural Pez show, for lack of a better name. But joining me today in studio via Zoom, live from Denver, Colorado? Uh, Boulder, Colorado. Boulder, Colorado. Is Spencer Martin, the author and owner of Beyond the Peloton, which is a fantastic newsletter that takes you way deeper inside the strategy and potential outcomes and what happened on the road of professional road racing and road cycling. Spencer, thanks for joining us, man. I've been reading your newsletter for a while. Um, I was so happy when you agreed to let us uh, use some of your stuff as content and share it with our Pez readers. Welcome to, uh, to the broadcast. Thanks for coming in for a chit chat. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me, Richard. I've, um, I've been a big fan of Pez for a while, and I'm flattered that you wanted me to be part of the show. All right. Well, you know, like I always say, us, us the little guys, we got to stick together, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. All right. So what are, you know, it's not like we're just here to yip yap about nothing, even though essentially that's what we were just joking about a couple of minutes ago. Uh, both of us have um, some similar stories in that we are, you know, relatively small players in the vast landscape of road cycling. Um, we both got here somehow. And I think, you know, I I've had this question posed to me many times over the last almost 20 years of publishing Pez, and that was, how did you get started? And so when I talk to people who are doing similar stuff to what we're doing and, and making a dent in the media landscape, I'm always really interested in that backstory and that background. So Spencer, can you tell us a little bit about, about you know, beyond the Peloton, your sort of philosophy, your reason for being, how you got here and how you got started? Yeah, no, I, I would love to talk about that. I'll keep it brief because um, I could go on for, for hours about this. But long story short, I, I moved to Maui to try to become a professional cyclist. Um, was, ha, ha, you know, mixed, mixed success, rose to, you know, like a, a national elite level. Um, had a few bad crashes, washed out of that. Was working a regular desk job at a, a pretty boring company. If I try, started to explain it, you, you'd probably fall asleep. But um, while I was doing that, my um, I would get up early every morning and watch cycling races, the Tour de France, the Giro d'Italia. And then I would spend all day just kind of like secretly reading about what happened in the race and listening to every podcast I could listen to at my desk, just made it look like I was on phone calls. Um, and even I would email like Vela News articles to myself um, so I could read and it looked like I was reading an email, but I was really just reading about the races from the day. <laughs> And um, I, 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 it's a good thing that you were reading cycling material. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. And I would, and yeah, I was just kind of after a while of like watching the races, I, I would think, Matt, I would love to just be talking about this all the time, as opposed to going into meetings. And yeah, I would like if I had to miss the end of a stage because of a meeting, I would just be like, what am I doing? This is this is the worst. Um, and I started a site called beyondthepelotonblog.com, and I, I would just kind of try to treat the sport with the same, you know, analytical mind and, and strategy that, you know, maybe a Zach Lowe or a Nate Duncan does with basketball. And, you know, I, I really enjoyed it, and I, I knew I wanted to do it full time. So eventually I left that job and, and started the newsletter beyondthepeloton.substack.com, um, and now I do daily coverage for pretty much every major race. So how did you get this idea to be the guy doing, doing a newsletter? Just, you know, it's like you're, you're not working for a, a, one of the, the cycling sites or a magazine. You're just a guy who's now got access to everything on the internet. And, you know, it's like kind of a, it takes a certain, um, to a certain amount of <laughs> bravery, stupidity, direction and some lack of direction because I've done this myself to go to the edge of the cliff and jump off the cliff and you know not only do you hope the parachute may or may not open you sometimes you don't even know if you're wearing a parachute so how did you like come up with this idea that, you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna be the guy doing a newsletter <laughs> that's a yeah it's a good question it's, it's it's an insane thing to do I mean even the thought of why would anyone need to hear my thoughts on on a race like that's you know, it's, I guess it is somewhat narcissistic and insane, but, you know, it really was bred of just from, I used to want to be like a writer at like Bella News. Like that was my goal, you know, just send me to the tour and I'll write 
pieces about it, you know, but over time I realized, you know, as a consumer, I was like, I'm not really getting the content I want. Um, I'm not, it's not digging deep enough for me. So I feel you know, that was, brother. I feel that <laughs> <laughs> it was almost over time, just frustration of just like, God, I'm not quite seeing what I'm seeing from, from really astute analysts in other sports. And um, I'm going to do it because I'm driving my wife crazy ranting and raving around the house after the races so she was a big part of it like you got to get these thoughts out there because you're driving everyone insane at home so um i i didn't set out to do this but to me the least res- path the least resistance was just you know take the emails i'd collected on the website and start a newsletter yeah you know what if listen if people aren't listening to you at home you have to find a new audience i learned that a long time ago <laughs> but i i love i love what you said your comment there about not being satisfied with the uh, the coverage that was there. You weren't seeing the stuff that you wanted to watch because that um, is exactly what I went through. And that's what I thought when I started Pez in like 2002. And, you know, similar to, to you, I was like, I, I had been reading um, the sites of the time, Velo News, Cycling News. Uh, there was a couple others out there. And there was lots of race focus, very, a bit of technical stuff. Some, you know, the magazines were covering a bit of gear and stuff, but there, I'd been to the tour, I'd been to the Giro and I knew how much fun it was to be at those races. But when I came back here, I could not read or see any coverage that felt like I was at the race. And so my kind of reason was, you know what, the coverage I want to see is what's it like to be there? just hanging around in the start village or uh, riding your bike on the course, doing one of the climbs, hanging out with the fans, uh, having lunch in a village, all that stuff that makes up a day in the life of a fan. Nobody was covering that at all. And so I was like, you know what, that's, that's the stuff I would like to be, to be doing and, and just going over there and start writing stories about what we saw. And that's what, that's exactly what we did. And we sort of launched roadside reporting as we called it. And of course now with Facebook and social media and stuff, every kid with a, an iPhone and a Wi-Fi connection is also doing some version of the same thing. But, but we were the, I contend we were the first guys to bring it to a large scale. <laughs> yeah, it was groundbreaking stuff. And I remember those, inter- those like, you know, so-and-so gets pezzed and it would be these super personal <laughs> interviews that people wouldn't, you wouldn't get other places. Exactly. I know, remember this is, well, listen, don't look now, but Spencer Martin, you're getting pezzed. Oh no. <laughs> you're getting, <laughs> this is a Pez exclusive interview <laughs> right here, right now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, yeah, I mean, our for our thing was, I, I came up with this little idea, uh, our tagline would be, what's cool in road cycling? It used to be what's cool in pro cycling, but then as pro cycling, the, the kind of became less popular, I decided to just expand, <laughs> pivot a little bit. And, you know, part of the, the mentality was, we're just going to tell readers that if you are looking for something cool in road cycling, yeah, this is the place you're going to find it. And also if, if we're talking about it, then we have deemed it to be cool enough for you as a discerning reader to check out. So it was, you know, a bit of this marketing BS, I suppose, but nevertheless, you got to stake your, put your stake in the sand somewhere Yeah, yeah, yeah. for something. Yeah. Great. I don't know. What do you stand for? What does Beyond the Peloton stand for? I don't know if we were going to come up with a what your slogan. I, I'd say it would be, you know, I, I got to find a slogan, maybe like treating pro cycling with the respect it deserves, where I felt like a lot of the analysis was more, it was more almost, it was very biased. You read like, especially English language coverage. And I, I felt like the story they were telling and the facts on the road were not aligning. Um, and I don't know if I just noticed that more over time or it actually got worse over time, but um, specifically 2020 when it was just, you know, a lot of talk of like Chris Room's going to win the Tour de France. And it's like, he's not, like, he's not going to win. Like if you're paying attention to the facts, you would see that this is not a possibility. And that's kind of what pushed me over the edge and, and got me to do the newsletter. Do you, do you think that that uh, bias was a lack of, effort on the part of the reporters and the media covering it or was there what what do you think 
would I cause that sort of just, oh, go with the flow there. Everybody's talking about Chris Room. Just say that. I think it's two main things. I think, first of all, like the scope of responsibilities that a lot of these websites is so big. You just don't have time. Like these, a lot of these major sites probably aren't even watching the races, let alone even watching them closely. And then Monday rolls around and they have to say something. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of these people live like normal lives. Like they're not dedicating their weekend to watching cycling. Yeah. Um, so, so you just get misinformed stuff and it's not all their fault. I mean, a lot of these major companies drifted a lot from just the original mission statement of pro cycling. It was more of like a lifestyle or, or tech coverage. And then also, I, I know this, I know this was pushed when I worked at a bigger site that they just wanted to shape the storyline to drive traffic. So if Chris Room's going to win the tour, more people are going to read that story, um, which isn't their fault. If, if you're an ad driven site, you, you know, you can make more money doing something like that versus more like boring, factual, stati statistical based analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I went with the, the subscription model where you can kind of pay for something that might not be as sexy that could drive clicks. Just tell us about how the structure. So how many times a week do you do the newsletter and what does it cost to subscribe? So I, it comes out if you, there's a free edition, it comes out once a week. So if you don't want to pay anything, um, you can sign up and you get one free one at minimum per week. Um, paying subscribers get daily newsletters during grand tours and during non-grand tours weeks, it's three times per week. So, and I'll always cover a major race, you know, like a monument, um, any type of significant one day race, small yeah. week long races. Um, okay. And it's $7 a month or $70 a year. Um, I like that I kind of have the, the dual model and I think it works really well. How long does, I mean, I've been reading your newsletters um, for, for a few weeks now, and sorry about, if you can hear that in the background, that's my cat, who shares my garage workspace with me sometimes. <laughs> he just came out to use the litter box, and when he does it, he likes to meow afterwards, some kind of an announcement or something, like, so bear with me. That the cat's going to be a hit. The cat's going to be a celebrity. That'll disappear. He will. Maybe I'll bring him, maybe I'll bring him over. Popeye, come here. Hang on. Watch this. And... Here we hey. go. <laughs> oh, is, yeah, that's a good this is cat. Popeye. He's been around for about 16, 17 oh. years. He's a, sorry, back to my well, my question. I, so I've been reading the newsletter now for a few months and, and really enjoying it. But when I when I read this thing, you know, you've got 10 takeaways from these events and, and there's a lot of material that you put in there. You sort of a race summary and then you kind of get down to your takeaways. And I'm thinking to myself, man, how long does it take you to write one of these things? Yeah, I was, as someone asked me this earlier today, um, the short answer would be if I give myself like a two hour timer, I can do it in two hours. Um, but the part that's not, you know, it's like after a tour stage, I'll often like go for a ride and like, I'm thinking about this thing 24 seven, you know, it's like, yeah, the work is kind of like spinning upstairs and then I'll put it together when I sit down. But um, short answer, I like to do it in two to four hours. Long answer. 24 hours a day <laughs> I'm, I'm working like I'm waking up during race season thinking about like okay like how's it going to play out today and what yeah. am I going to what you know how's that going to affect my analysis do you ever have particular storylines that you follow or that may guide some of your you know just the, the ahead of time that you're thinking well I'm, I'm thinking about this or this this is something I got to watch I do yeah yeah and a lot of stuff it's kind of the it sounds crazy because there's so many additions that you think, how could anything get left on the cutting room floor? But a lot of stuff just never makes it out. I just have like an internal notebook um, of just constant storylines I'm following that I maybe even never even talk about in the newsletter because I just think it bloats it too much. So, um, and, and I do do a, a weekly podcast where I try to maybe go over some of the stuff that I just couldn't fit in the newsletter. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I do have like, a lot of times I'll be thinking like if, you know, if, if Pogacar cannot lose time on today's stage, like he's probably got this in the bag. So, and then I'll be watching that as the race goes on. Do you have access to, to the riders or the teams or anything like that, that may in some way even influence your coverage? Um, I do have riders. I will speak to kind of on background, um, but a lot of times they're busy racing, you know, a lot, I'm very race focused. So, the majority of my 
content comes out during the races. Um, the riders probably don't have a ton of time, but I a lot of team managers are, are subscribers and they'll <laughs> they'll let me know if they disagree with something I said or they think I need more information about a topic. And the same thing with rider agents where I definitely know quite a few are subscribers and I'll, I'll get an earful as soon as I send something out if they want to add more information to that. Right. Well, I, I like the fact with your with your newsletter that you are um it's largely armchair based where you're you're watching this stuff unfold and then you're offering your your opinion and your analysis of what's going on without it being influenced by an agenda from the teams or the riders or the organizers or the race the companies that own the races or any of that stuff and it's it makes it you know i think it makes it it's really refreshing um coverage style because we don't see a lot of that especially you know on, on on my side of things where we're we're following racing and stuff and there's always this challenge to uh you don't want to piss too many people off by saying yeah. the wrong thing because i need those ad dollars or something like that but have you thought about the idea of beyond the peloton getting to a scale large enough where you may be influenced by things other than just your own editorial integrity and curiosity it's definitely something i think about and worry about um I think potential protection against that model is that the bulk, I, I believe the bulk of my revenue will always be derived from subscribers. So it's kind of power in numbers where, you know, if Shimano gets mad at me because I think that their 12 speed drivetrain is causing more failures during races, uh, they have less power to just pull ads from my site, which would be a big fear if, if you're an ad based site. Um, I, I would have a hard time in that position knowing what to do. Um, what, I mean, I do, I, I've found out like quite a few famous people in the sport read it, which does like just internally make it difficult where I'm like, do I really want to say this? Um, and this person's going to read it, but I think you just kind of have to keep, you know, you have to stay true to yourself because that's why people were interested in you in the first place. Yeah. You know what? I think that is a really good point is, um, the reason people are paying attention is because you're saying something that not everyone else is saying, or you are, you know, there's a certain feeling of um, having a conversation with somebody that you went on a ride. Say you're out on a ride with your buddies or some guys and you're talking about something and people aren't too worried about what they're going to say. They don't filter too much. They just say stuff and you have these conversations that are interesting and, and they may or may not be based on fact, but the opinions and exchanging opinions is always fun and entertaining. And that's kind of what I think we've done at Pez is we've offered up our own opinions and people can like them or, or flush them as they see fit. But and I, I, I've been watching racing for, you know, 30, 40 years now. And I'm, and I got more interested in race coverage when I started reading your newsletter, because it took me just deeper into the racing than I could get from a regular race report. Well, that's very nice of you to say, and that's high praise. And it is something I try to do is to, it's a hard line to walk. I'm sure you guys deal with this, um, where it's like, how do you appeal to someone who's just getting into the sport? And it might not know who like Greg LeMond is versus someone like yourself who's been following the sport for so long. And how can you offer something interesting to both of those people? Mm -hmm. So I, I try to make it in-depth enough that someone like you, who has a grand knowledge of cycling, can enjoy it while also being, you know, not so dense that, that someone who's just picking up cycling could come in and be like, I want to learn more about this sport mm -hmm. and, and can enjoy it. So that's a big challenge that I face, I'm sure everybody faces, but something I'm thinking about all the time. Yeah. You know what? That just gave, gave me thought to another interesting question is, you know, we both have lived through the rise of the popularity of cycling in North America, thanks largely to Lance Armstrong. And he was, uh, you know, as a, a very uh, magnetic figure and everybody wanted to watch him and he was kicking ass at the tour de France and beating everybody all the time. And it was, he was just a great American sports hero for a period of time. Um, what, what now, and, and when Lance was, was big, there was a wave of popularity of cycling that everybody was riding and, and making money off of, including Pez, because more people were interested in what they wanted to watch cycling because Lance was in it. And so all we had to do was start covering it and people were paying attention. Brands flourished because more people wanted to start riding their bikes all because of this one guy. So Lance isn't in the sport anymore. He 
effective, you know, arguably had a very negative impact on the sport when he came down. What about the current crop of American riders? So we, there isn't anybody on the landscape who, in fact, even you could argue that pro cycling does not have a figure in pro cycling that was as dominant and as big and flamboyant as a lance. So where, do, where does that leave us? What, what do you think about the current state of personalities in cycling? That's a good question. I even yeah, even the major Lance. I mean, I think we have to accept Lance was potentially a one of the con, like a one of the kind, like a black swan event where he was just he's a magnetic person. He's very charismatic. Um, he's good at expressing, you know, cycling in an interesting way, which most people aren't. He also had cancer, which um, and then came back from it and then won the tour. That's just a pretty interesting story. If, if you didn't know about it and I just told you that story, you'd say, that's pretty interesting. I'd like to hear more. Yeah. Um, that's not going to happen again. But it is concerning to me that, I, I guess I find it interesting, even the big, big stars, like Julian Alaphilippe is a fairly niche star, or even Peter Sagan, who is really charismatic, like really you know, famous in cycling. He's not that well known outside of cycling. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it comes down to, and he's about as interesting a character as, as you possibly can be while still like operating in society. Okay. And he, I think it's maybe just, we're seeing the fact that there, it, with F1, there's F1, F1 is a company that owns the sport of F1 and they can deploy marketing assets in a strategic way. Cycling is just kind of a collection of old families that own races. It's not an ideal way. You would not set a business up this way. I think that holds a lot of it back. There's no centralized marketing agency who can kind of polish all these, all this raw data and all these interviews and, and make it into some type of compelling personality soup, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or there's the soup, there's no bowl. But, you know, it's, that's one thing that I think is really interesting about pro cycling. I've always, I was always attracted to it was the international aspect. So you would have all these different nationalities of guys meeting on the playing surface, duking it out at the same time. So you've got all these interesting um, cultures and languages and guys not understanding each other necessarily because they didn't come from the same place. Um, there is no other sport where... You, on the playing field of any one event, you have all of these nationalities and players battling at the same time. <laughs> yeah, the internationality is so interesting. And I do think it, uh, maybe part of the disconnect is uh, like, let's say you're a very good American or you're a Canadian, you probably have to join a foreign team, like a European-based team. Um, you just have to be very good to, for that team because that team is eating your contract because there's no Yumbo supermarkets in Canada or the U S right. um, they're wasting a spot by sponsoring a North American rider. Yeah. We can, we can literally cannot go buy their products. Yeah. Um, so you have to be that good just to make it. And then once you're on a European team, I think you're slightly invisible to the North, the North American media. Like um, if you're on EF, you get a lot more attention than if you're on Yumbo. Yeah. So, and we're seeing like Brandon McNulty on he's on UAE very good rider. I think actually one of the best American riders in a long time, mm -hmm. basically invisible to anyone, but the biggest fans of the sport. So mm -hmm. I, and I, I think, I mean, you're having like, a, there's a, this Canadian businessman running around right now, tr literally trying to hand someone money to sponsor a team and they won't take it. If there was a more defined way to get into the sport for, for major North American business people to get into the sport, yeah. You could see a lot more cultivating of, of North American personalities. All right. Well, that is, that's going to bring our show to a close, but obviously we are not finished talking about any of this stuff because the sport goes on and we've got things to say about it. So um, Spencer, thanks for joining us. Um, just can you remind viewers where they can find you and how they can uh, subscribe to your newsletter? Yeah, you can find the newsletter at beyondthepeloton.substack.com and feel free to become a free non-paying member. That is more than welcome. Um, but if you really want to dive in deep, I do recommend that uh, additional membership. Seven bucks a month, man. That is, that's a, a, that's a great deal. You can't go wrong for that. It's like the price of two coffees. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Or one expensive coffee in New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So I'll put a link 
to uh, Beyond the Peloton down in the below in the description of this video. And uh, keep your eye on Pez and also um, the podcast. Where can people find your podcast? Um, you can find it anywhere podcasts are sold or given away. Um, it's called Beyond the Peloton Podcast, Spotify, Apple, Overcast, Pocket Cast. Um, that's just search for Beyond the Peloton Podcast and it will show up. Fantastic. All right. Okay, Spencer, thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you soon, I hope. And I'll be, I'll be reading you even sooner. <laughs> oh, thanks, thanks, Richard. And I look forward to being on. All right.